Welcome to Off the Press within the Breakfast Show, as we do always serve you the newspaper reviews to see what is going on in our national dailies. I won't be alone. I'll be joined virtually from Ondo State by Public Affairs Analyst Femi Lawson. Good to have you, Mr. Lawson. Good, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining in. So we will begin. I will read out the headlines for the paper we are in, um, reviewing and then I hand over to you. So we shall begin with the Punch newspaper right away. Um, federal government reciprocates bans European Union flights from Nigeria and the story is on page 20. We also have killings. NBA bows to pressure, drops El Rufai from Comfab and that's also on page 2. COVID-19 drug trial will begin in 13 states soon, according to the Presidential Task Force, and the story is on page 16 of the Punch newspaper. Karma unacceptable, ungodly, a time bob, says the Christian Association of Nigeria, and that's the picture of the President Ayokunle there. The story is also on page 8. Uh, there we have, I don't know when Magu probe will end, according to Salami. So grab a copy to find out when that will happen. And the federal government impounds Angola passengers plane in Lagos. It's on page 21. How did it get into the country? I thought we uh, had banned international flights. That explains what Captain Ujukutu was talking about earlier on. The story is on page 21, by the way. And we have the big story. Chinese loan probe. Others stalled as reps suspend panel sitting on page 2. Don't compromise investigation. CSO wants National Assembly members. We will continue probe after resumption. NDDC committee chair and others say, I am not aware of suspension of activities, says the lone panel chair. Uh, and then we have a picture story of a um, core member, I believe, yes, some core member with the Director General of the National Service Corps there. We also have, during a visit to the NYC um, uh, government uh, garment factory. Oh, interesting. That's in Mina, yeah? Niger State. And that happened yesterday. You have the uh, photo story there. We also have police uh, place five million naira bounty on suspected or your serial killer's head. That's the 19 year old uh, guy who um, disappeared from police custody. The story is on page seven. Five million naira bounty. Uh, Flynn Ogun engineer. Oh, it's 500,000. Is that, is that the correction I'm getting? Oh, 0.5 million. Okay. Thank you to the uh, production crew that are trying to get me say the right thing. Okay. Thank you for that. So 0.5 million a bounty on suspected or your serial killer uh, heads. Why didn't they just put it easy so we know? Anyways, that's it. Flynn Ogun, engineer who raped neighbor's daughter, arrested. Again, cases of rape on the National Daily every other day. The story is on page five, I believe. And Sultan declares Friday Islamic New Year, also on page nine. That is the Hijra, I believe. And we have Arotile's two suspects freed and driver to escape death. That is on uh, the story of Arotile. We remember that story. God rest her. The story is on page nine. Workers, uh, this story. Walker's headless body found on company premises. That story is on pages four and five. It's so chilling even to read of the Punch newspaper. And lastly, postponing Edo on polls will create constitutional crisis, according to INEC. That story, I believe, is also on page eight. Now over to you, Mr. Lawson. Uh, let's, be, let's know which story is catching your attention and which one you like to begin with immediately. Well, I think uh, the stories are all very important, but I think one story that captures the interest of most Nigerians <clears throat> yesterday is the decision of the National Executive Committee of the NBA to withdraw its earlier invitation to the Governor of Kaduna State as one of the speakers at this coming you know, conference. Mm. That has been trending since yesterday, and I think it's an issue that has generated series of controversies over the last few days. It has necessitated you know, a series of online petitions, you know, from lawyers and non-lawyers, you know, in the country, based on the current security situation, you know, in Kaduna State. And of mm -hmm. course, a lot of Nigerians see Governor Erufai as lacking the moral, you know, standing presently to address such a conference, you know, of, of a body of constitutional 
you know, people. Mm -hmm. So it is not just, you should not just be seen, you know, as a denier of that opportunity without him to speak at the, the very important MBA conference. But what lesson has been learned, not only by Governor Rufa in this regard, Correct. but by all the Nigerians who are positioned, you know, to be responsible mm. to citizens. Governor Rufa, if you study, you know, his body language over the last couple of months, has not shown enough, you know, commitment, you know, to, as far as some Nigerians are concerned, to the situation, you know, in Southern Kaduna, a state he governs. You know, every day there are reported cases of killings, and you know, it's it builds on the people to actually call the governor out to come and actually see making more statements and make taking more steps practically to address the situation in southern Kaduna mm -hmm. rather than coming, you know, to speak at a very important, you know, conference or, or such as that of NBA. So that has been a very trending issue. Mm. And, and I think yesterday. just I to think add that it was wise for the neck of the Nigeria Bar Association to have, to have taken that decision yesterday. Mm. And, and I think and just to add a lot of applause, if you understand, if you followed, you know, the opinion of lawyers, especially the young lawyers in the country. All right. I was just going to say, uh, just to add that, and yes, uh, it's not. Can I you hear me? Think, I'm afraid you can't hear me. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, so I was just saying that, moving on from that conversation, yes. that it's not a lesson for the governor only, but for all those in leadership, uh, that those who are in leadership will yes. do what they need to do, and that the people also take responsibility to say, yes, uh, we demand for good governance, yes, which is exactly, what a democratic exactly. process should be. It's not about, uh, you know... Yes. Uh, just attacking an individual, but it's requesting and asking for good governance. So please proceed to your next uh, uh, headline co co correct. conversation. That also, you know, very instructive. Nigerians, you know, have shown a lot of interest in a you know, series of revelations that have been coming out, or, you know, as far as the loans so far obtained by this government, particularly from the you know, Chinese authorities, on developing some critical infrastructure in Nigeria, we must understand that at every time a country takes a loan, you know, these are loans that are repayable and it is often not, you know, repaid by the generation of people that are taking this loan. So the next generation of Nigerians are seriously interested and should be interested in whatever conditions are attached to loans being taken by government. And I think we all saw what that are generated, rising from, you know, some investigations being conducted by the National Assembly. And I think uh, just like the fears that some civil society organizations and, you know, West Britain Nigerians are beginning to raise, I think Nigerians deserve to know further details, you know, about conditions attached to this loan. We've seen a lot of funny revelations, but I think just like it has been demanded, the National Assembly, for no reason, you know, should... Should the National Assembly for no reason stop, you know, the probe of these uh, conditions attached to some of these dead, it will be, you know, an injustice not only to Nigerians, but to the future of this country. And I think it is important that details are made known because these debts are taking the name of Nigerians and Nigerians are going to pay it back. So Nigerians deserve to know the details, you know, attached to some of the, these debts as in conditions. And... I think the National Assembly has restated its commitment into continuing the probe as soon as it returns. And the last, like you know, has not heard about the probe of the NDDC, which is a major, you know, scandal rocking the politics as we speak. I was happy to listen to the one of the House of Representatives Committee on NDDC, who has promised that it is not yet over. Mm -hmm. Nigerians are anxiously waiting. And we want to strongly believe that this will not end up in a family affair in, within the government eventually. So we are hoping that the National Assembly lives up to its promise mm -hmm. and the expectation of Nigerians by ensuring that details you know, of this probe and logical conclusions are arrived at in, you know, in letting Nigerians know, you know some of the implications of these loans, you know, these revelations arising from this probe. And I think it's going to be a major step, you know, as far as the transparency 
you know, and the anti-corruption, you know, who said of this incumbent administration is concerned. All right. Let's take uh, the Guardian newspaper. Thank you so very much for that intervention. Uh, we'll, we'll now go to the Guardian newspaper already displayed. Thank you to the production crew as well. Foreign investors shun South-South as uh, oil runs dry. Mm -hmm. That's on the front page. As stakeholders blaming security and poor governance for that, New Lagos refinery will pump crude oil fr crude from region and why region needs stability now by experts. All of those you can find on the front page. We have the COVID-19 also updates there. Just to remind you again that in Nigeria, we've passed the 50,000 mark and Nigeria now has 50,964 confirmed cases of COVID-19. Thankfully, 37,000 569 have recovered so far, but we have also lost 992 persons to COVID-19. All right, we also have there on the front page, Khan rejects new company law and seeks review, wants the federal government to avert crisis over Kama 2020, and says the act a declaration of war on Christianity. All right, we also have NMPC dismisses rumor of missing crude oil ready for probe. All right, that's the reason, page four. It is good when, you know, organizations say, we are ready, come and see for yourself. So that sounds good. The story is on page four, by the way. And Buhari seeks uh, stiffer sanctions for Malian uh, junta and restoration of civil rule. He was at that uh, ECOWAS virtual conference yesterday, and you, we heard in the news. So the story is also on page three. Nigerians abroad protest against Kaduna killings and task US and others. Yes, and then we have again prime suspect for culpable homicide uh, for the Arotile, the late Arotile case. Um, that story is on page uh, homicide. He goes, uh, it says the suspect in for culpable homicide has called freeze the other two. The story is on page five. Thank you very much. The one on Khan is also on the front page, but it's continued on page six. And over now to you, uh, Mr. Lawson, which is catching your attention. We look at the Guardian very quickly in the interest of time. Well, the the, the, the front you know, is catching actually uh, this is a very it's a, an important issue of serious concern. If you look at the significance of that sector to the survival of our economy, for a country that you know largely depends on oil as its major source of revenue, you know it should be of serious concern to us as it is that you know we are yet able to diversify, mm -hmm. we are yet to improve on alternative source or sources of generating you know our national wealth other than this oil, and the situation in the south south presently only tells you know you about the security situation in the country as a whole. If you look at the factors that have been you know, ascribed to this, you know, this, this emerging trend you know, in the South-South, which is the hub of the Nigerian you know, oil industry, you realize that it has to do with militancy, sea piracy, you know, and all sort of you know, security challenges being confronted by investors in that sector. And no economic can try under an atmosphere of insecurity. Today, the country is overwhelmed by a series of security challenges. Today, almost every region of the country has one security challenge or the other. And it is beginning to turn not only on the lives and properties of the other Nigerians, but it's taking its toll on the economic country. And that is a reflection you know, of what is presently happening in that region of the country. And I think it calls, you know, for serious, you know, national emergency. Mm. We have consistently demanded for this, that there should be a declaration of national emergency in our, on our security sector. There is a fundamental need to redesign and, you know, reassess the security architecture of this country as presently constituted. And because the revelations, like I said, and the implications is not just you know, tell on the life of the other people, but on the life of the country itself, because the economic survival of the country is not affected. I'm also, you know, very much interested in, you know, reactions that have trailed, you know, the new, you know, Kama, you know, act yes. as signed by the president just uh, you know, a few weeks back. One thing that that has revealed, if you have followed this critically, is that there was little or no practical engagement of stakeholders. Mm. 
before the final decision of Kama 2020 was taken. And this could be seen from the series of reactions that are beginning to trail this act, which some people initially you know, applauded and raised when President Muhammad Buhari signed it a couple of days, weeks back. It only shows that in our lawmaking process, in our decision-making process, we are not doing enough of engagement, engagement of status. Because any law that has to do with, you know, a vast majority of citizens should always be seen to have, you know, the input of citizens. And that is the only way we can prevent, you know, scenarios like we have, we have seen religious organizations, you know, non-governmental organizations, even professional bodies rising against this. And this is about a 604 pages of law that has been done now on Nigerians without their you know, fundamental inputs. So I think the government must critically consider the reactions that have followed this and see the need for the earliest possible you know, amendments, you know, and you know, possible amendment of some of some aspects of this law. Of course, there are a lot of laudable aspects of this law that have been applauded by Nigerians, but those that seems to violate some basic you know, provision of the constitution has to be addressed. Especially when you look at you know the constitutionally guaranteed you know, rights of Nigerians to associate, you know, the freedom of association and how some of the content of cameras run contrary to it, hmm. then it becomes important, you know, for government to consider the possibility of a review of some of the, of, of this critical aspect of the law that are now being you know, charged. And I want to uh, say that uh, it's of very long stress to let Nigerians know that it might it's still very, very, very much around us. Oh, we have a problem to with go you. Go back to normal. Nigerians are beginning to, you know, like we have overcome this. But the truth is that the re revelations from the NCDC and our stakeholders yesterday, you know, only tells us one thing: that we are still very, very, we, we still have COVID-19 being prevalent as well as being. We need very full. Nigeria must not relax and begin to know that things are normal. Things are not normal and every precaution must still be adopted. And as we are expanding, opening further, or reopening rather, our economy, because of you know the lift on some of these uh, restrictions that were, they were imposed during the, the COVID-19 outbreak, we must remain conscious of those pre precautions that will limit what is imagined now, a mm -hmm. continuous spread, especially at a time when there has been no you know, visible cure you know, for this pandemic. So we have to remain as careful as we were in the previous months in ensuring that, of course, we don't encourage a further spread of this very deadly pandemic. All right, let's go to the Nation newspaper, uh, Mr. Lawson, uh, if you don't mind already displayed, lawmakers NDDC in row over removal of 10 billion naira rice project. <laughs> that story is on page five, yeah? Ministers and senators, reps, as well as as governors behind illegal mining in Oshun, and that story is on page seven. Government limits passengers on inbound flights on page six, or you to approve paternity leave. Isn't that interesting? I'm sure so many Men will be happy. All right, that story is um, inside the newspaper. Unfortunately, it looks like it's page, I guess it's page 25. It's not legible enough. Ize Yamo asks police to unmask suspects behind violence in Medo. Democracy be, being undermined, says Secundus. And PDP members back out of Jagede's campaign. Akira Dolutu announced uh, tuition fees reduction. That's good news, the reduction of tuition fees, I mean. The big story for the Nation newspaper is Buhari Oke's community policing takeoff with 13 billion naira. Governors and uh, SGF, IG and others to meet on modalities on how to spend that money. Um, I believe 
We also have a picture story there. Uh, and that's Mali. Uh, Mali has been on the news. And ECOWAS asks uh, Mali Junta to reinstate Keita's uh, government. Nigeria seeks stiffer regional sanctions. Uh, the president was seen uh, having that conversation in the virtual conference yesterday. That story is on the front page, but it's continued inside the newspaper. And finally, bounty placed on killer suspect, 500,000 euro, by the way, was corrected. And that story is on page five. If you do know where he is, 500,000 might just be waiting for you to claim. Police recruitment uh, screening for Monday, that one is also inside the newspaper. And now to you, Mr. Lawson. Well, uh, I am particularly interested in the editorial, you know, talking about the approval for the takeoff, you know, the community policing initiative. Mm -hmm. It is the right step. It's encouraging, and I think it's a it's one of the you know very needed you know intervention to address the you know, series of insecurities presently confronting the country. What I would rather have you know expected that we deepen this further by ensuring that we do not just reduce this to an executive policy, but rather we should use this opportunity of the import, the importance of you know community policing to do the needed constitutional you know amendment that will empower states you know, and empower the country to have you know the state policing system you know, structure. It is still the best way out of you know some of these challenges confronting us as far as critics is concerned, and the time you know we are faced presently demands that we do not only continue to wait on the central government, you know, to get our communities, you know, well secured and policed, because today, irrespective of the nomenclature mm. that this initiative may be given, the truth is that it's still an idea that is controlled by the federal government. And any, any society whose, you know, security is centralized in the way we have our own, we have an effective policing system. That is the truth, irrespective of the nomenclature. I'm afraid we're having a problem with that connection. And unfortunately also, uh, that's where we're going to wrap this conversation on off the press because of time. Uh, when he comes, I hope he sees this. Thank you so very much, Femi uh, Lawson, who's a public affairs analyst trying to make sense of the dailies with me. We will take a quick break. When we return, we'll wrap up the breakfast.